Hi, and welcome to the Origins Podcast, the Origins Project Foundation, another little bit of physics. Uh, you remember, remember the last time I talked about uh, the anomaly in the muon magnetic moment and as, a, as a possible signature of new physics beyond the physics we now know. Today I want to talk about physics we know, and I want to answer a question from a biological colleague of mine who asked me why, why it's so universal that waves are everywhere, why the universe vibrates. And it, it's, uh, it's a great example of the fact that um, the ubiquity of physics, the, the fact that an explanation in one context can be reused in so many different contexts. Once you understand it in one place, you can use it in many, many different places. And it's simple enough that I thought it would be, it'd be fun to describe uh, even though traditionally it's kind of mathematical, but we'll see how we can do here. So, so I've again written on uh, on some paper and moved my position, so I think it'll be a little clearer than it was before. So, what I want to talk about is why the world vibrates. And the first point is that the world is in 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 equilibrium in some in the sense that um, the reason that oh, I'm sitting here and that the oxygen in the in this room is in a, a uniform pressure is that. Uh, that if you make a deviation from an equilibrium position, the world wants return to that position. That's what equilibrium means. If you don't have such a situation, then 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 then, then you 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 either go into chaos or you or you rapidly change from where you are. So anytime you're in equilibrium, what what that really means is that if when you make a departure from equilibrium. There's something that make that 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 causes the system to return the, to the situation it was in. We can describe that as follows. Let's define the quantity x. And I love when I talk about x to young kids, and I talk about algebra. They say, "What does x mean?" And I and the answer is x can mean whatever you want it to be. In this case, I want it to be represent generically the departure from equilibrium. It can be the height above the ground. It can be the amount you stretch a rubber band. It can be it can be how you pull up a pendulum from its from its resting position or it can be in the case of say predator prey relationships where you have an equilibrium number of sheep and wolves if you change the number of sheep then the number of wolves that can survive will go down and and so that's a departure from that equilibrium position or or in the simplest case a spring when you stretch it or 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 press it in that distance that you do that is it, it, I'll call x and the whole point of equilibrium is that is that there, nature has a restoring force the f- there's a force that's proportional to minus some constant times the departure from equilibrium. The further you are away from equilibrium, the greater is the restoring force. When you're at equilibrium, when x is zero, the force is zero. So the, so- so the, si- the system wants to remain where it is. It's really that simple. All of nature has restoring forces to keep things in equilibrium. So what does this imply? To understand how, what this implies, I want to refer to the one equation that, that I hope everyone remembers from high school physics. F equals ma. Okay? That's Newton's equations for motion. Now, what does ma really mean? What does a really mean? The a is the rate of change of the rate of change of position. The rate of change of position is velocity. So, that's the rate at which position changes, and acceleration is the rate at which velocity changes. So acceleration is the rate of change of the rate of change of position. So, so what this is telling us, in this case of, of where I, I put ma on the left-hand side and kx on, minus kx on the right-hand side, is it's telling us that the rate of change of the rate of change of x, which you can see f is proportional to, because f is proportional to ma, F, F is equal to ma, so it's proportional to a. The rate of change of the rate of change of x is proportional to minus x. So if x is changing with time, the rate of change of the rate of change of x is proportional to minus x itself. So if x is a departure from equilibrium and you're 5 meters away versus 10 meters away, the rate of change of position the rate of change of the rate of change of position will be proportional to minus your position itself. Now we call this a second order differential equation and therefore it sounds complicated. But in mathematics, how do you generally solve second order differential equations? You guess the answer most of the time and and you guess the answer in terms of some well-defined functions. 
And let's consider the case of a sine, a sine function, which of course is really uh, a representation of a wave. A sine function, as you know, starts out at zero, goes up and goes down, and it oscillates, um, it oscillates uh, regularly. Okay? Now let's consider the rate of change of the rate of change. First, let's consider the rate of change of this function with time. This is x versus t. So this is how x is changing with t. And you're seeing it's oscillating back and forth with t as a sine curve. Well, what's the rate of change? Well, at, at, right at this point, you can see the rate of change of a curve is the slope of the curve. So the slope of the curve here is maximum. You can see it's changing very quickly. So the slope is a, is, a, is, a, is a large number here. But up at the top of the curve, the slope is zero. It's not changing at all. The slope is horizontal, and therefore it's not changing. So this goes to zero there. Similarly, um, uh, when you're right here, the slope, when you're right at, at sorry, when you're right, at, at, right at, back at zero again, the slope is now negative, and it's at a maximum. And then when you're at when you're at the minus the peak here, the slope is now zero, and so you can see that the slope oscillates back and forth. And we could we could draw this if you want, and I'll draw it if I can. Okay. Now, let's take the rate of change of the slope. Well, I should have drawn this. There. Well, the rate of change of the slope at this point is zero because we're at the peak. So that's zero. Right here, the rate of change is maximum and negative. So you're, you're, you have negative there. And then right here, it's zero again. And then you have positive, And then you have zero. So let me draw that curve. And what you can see, although I haven't drawn it as well as I'd like, but what you can see is this curve is exactly minus of that curve. When, this, when there's a lump going up here, there's a lump going down there. Oops, there. When there's a lump going down here, there's a lump going up there. And so this is proportional to minus sine of x of t. So you can see that the guessing the solution, if you have a sine curve, sine of x of t, then the rate of change of the rate of change of a sine curve is minus sine of x of t. You can go home and convince yourself the same thing is true for the cosine function. So we now know that generically, whenever you have a restoring force, the system over time will behave in a way to oscillate as a sine or a cosine, which is a wave, which is a vibration. And that's true for any system wherever x is a departure from equilibrium and wherever you have a restoring force, which is proportional to the, depar the, the departure from equilibrium. So, you know, there's many, many cases. And I've just drawn a few here. If I have a spring, if I stretch it, if I stretch the spring out, there'll be a restoring force, as you can see, trying to push it back in. If I squeeze the string, spring in, there'll be a restoring force trying to push it out. F equals minus kx. If I lift up a pendulum, when the pendulum's at its resting position, there's no force on it. When I pull it away from, from its resting position, gravity is acting on it. As I pull it more and more away, gravity is acting more and more because it's become because gravity is always acting downward. So here, since it's almost, since the the force is uh, the, that's pulling it back is is in this direction, but that's a very small component of gravity. Whereas if I go up here and the and and the, and the um, pendulum is all the way up here, the for the force pulling it back in is like this, and your and gravity is acting more on this. So you have gravity acting proportional to the to the if you wish the angle at which. I'm pulling this pendulum away from the origin. So in this case, the variable is theta, the angle, and the force is minus 
some constant times theta. Let's look at predator-prey relationships. Let's, let's say that this is the equilibrium position where if I have wolves and sheep, the system just remains the same as it is. Now let's say there's some departure from that, so suddenly I get more wolves. Well, what'll happen? If I have more wolves, I'll eat the sheep, so the system will move down to where the, pr the prey goes down. But once the prey goes down, um, uh, 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 um, uh, sorry, once, the, uh, once I have more wolves, the prey goes down, but once the prey goes down, you'll want to have less wolves because the wolves can. If you have fewer prey, there there'll be fewer wolves that can survive in that. If you look at this, basically the system will oscillate around that equilibrium point. The same is true for supply and demand in economics, which uses basic mathematics from from physics for for this kind of thing. Increase the supply, um, and um, and the price will go down. When the price goes down, the demand will go up. And then, and then the supply become less, and then, and then, uh, and then, uh, then an item will become more precious, and the and the uh, the the price will go up. So the price can oscillate about its equilibrium point. Pressure waves, sound waves. It, basically, I have atoms in the air, and when I basically a pressure wave is a region where where I have a lot of atoms close together, and they're colliding, and they want to spread out, or I have a diffuse place where the atoms are less populous than, than normal, and they want to basically fill in. And that kind of restoring force produces a sound wave, and, um, and it's a pressure wave. And that's true, not just true for air, but you can see it in galaxies. You can see pressure waves literally it's treating the, the stars and, and, uh, and gas as, as, a, as, a, as a fluid, if you wish, or as a gas. You'll, you can see pressure waves in the galaxies, the spiral arms of our galaxy. The last thing I want to point out is probably the most important, perhaps, for our existence example of this, and it was really what Maxwell did, and I won't go through this here now, but Maxwell derived equations for the relationship between electricity and magnetism, and then he showed something remarkable. In those equations, if you looked at them, the rate of change of the rate of change of either the electric field or the magnetic field via Maxwell's equations, turns out to be proportional to minus the electric field or minus the magnetic field. Namely, the equation is exactly the equation of a restoring force, and the result is an electromagnetic wave, and the proportionality constant, which depends upon literally how the strength of electricity and magnetism in, in, uh, propagate in empty space, produces a speed which he could calculate from solving that equation, and that speed turned out to be the speed of light. So the reason light is a wave and has speed c is because if you want to think of it, Maxwell's equations tell us there's a restoring force in nature and, ele and electric and magnetic fields, once they start to oscillate, will continue to oscillate. And, uh, and the rate at which they do that is proportional to their speed and, uh, and you drive the speed of light. So you can get from everywhere from springs to electromagnetism, really the... the, the, the um, electromagnetic waves, which are is behind everything, including my ability to talk to you now, just from that simple fact that nature, if it's in equilibrium, they'll have a restoring force, and the force is proportional to the amount you move things away from that equilibrium position. Once you have that in any case in nature, the mathematics is identical, and, you'll, and the result will always be oscillations as a function of time, oscillations that are proportional to a sine curve, or a cosine curve. Physics is universal.